Well, let me ask you a question first. I'm gonna talk a little bit of how we're looking for ET. How many of you think there's intelligence out there to be found? All right, so what am I doing talking here at a skeptics conference? <laughs> since you, we might as well all go out and try and find some coffee in the lobby. Um, <laughs> but I'm gonna talk, I am gonna you know, make a few words, uh, tell you a few words about how we're doing the search, but then uh, segue into something that's both irrelevant and definitely of little interest. Uh, for those of you who are old enough to remember, this is a George Adamski flying saucer, uh, the type that were popular in the early 19 or late 1950s, and you notice that these things are really going to be uncomfortable for interstellar travel because that round shape makes it very difficult to get your chest of drawers up against the wall. Uh, so there's that. Okay. Uh, let me just say a few things about SETI. I am occasionally, I am occasionally wondering why this goes this way. I'm occasionally asked at parties, well, very occasionally, because I usually don't get invited to parties. Uh, <laughs> but so, Seth, do you really think that there's life out there? And it always astounds me that they would ask that. I say, look, I wouldn't keep this job if I didn't think that, because after all, it's hardly lucrative and uh, there's no guarantee of success, so why wouldn't I become a CPA? No offense to any CPAs in the audience. But if they said, well, why do you think that? Because the bottom line, and you know this, the bottom line is we have not found any compelling evidence of biology beyond Earth, not yet. There have been a lot of claims. <laughs> They're in the papers almost every other week, but still uh, not enough to convince the scientists. But on the other hand, you can make this argument this is one of the Hubble extreme deep field photos of a tiny bit of the sky that you, know, you would cover up with a pinhead held like that. And uh, it's about a 100 hour exposure. And what you can see here are all these blotches of light. And essentially every one of them is a galaxy. All right, so those of you who remember high school science, a galaxy typically has 100 billion stars. So each of those blotches is 100 billion stars and the tiny ones are just galaxies that are farther away. Now, uh, the NASA budget doesn't allow Hubble to make photos like this all across the sky, but if you were to do that, you would count two trillion galaxies. That's the latest number. So in the visible universe, and this point has been made earlier in this conference, there are roughly 10 to the 22 stars. That's a lot of star pleasure, but of course, life won't cook up on stars unless you're a science fiction writer. It's gonna cook up on planets, but something we've learned in the past two dozen years is that most of these stars have planets. That's maybe the most exciting thing to to actually happen in the last two dozen years in astronomy. When I was a kid, just as the Civil War was coming to a close, I would go, go occasionally to the planetaria and they would tell you, well, you think there are planets around other stars? I'd say, well, maybe yes, maybe no. Nobody seemed to know, but now we know. And if, when I talk to the people who make a living out of looking for planets and I say, look, if you had perfect instruments, what fraction of stars would show planets? That number seems to vary. Sometimes they say 70%, sometimes they say 80%. Look, in astronomy, 70, 80% is the same as all. Uh, in astronomy, pi is equal to one. So <laughs> don't have them do your 1040 form. They'll get it right within a factor of two. Good enough. All right. So there, there are plenty of planets. Planets are like kittens. They don't, you don't get one, you get many. In our galaxy, maybe a trillion planets. Okay, you can go out and count them. And a lot of these planets are attractive in some sort of, uh, you know, I don't know, Earth-centric sense. Uh, Sun-like stars, maybe one in five, has a habitable Earth-sized planet. We don't really know if they're habitable. We don't know if they really have atmospheres and oceans and all that. But they're the right size, and they're the right average temperature based on their distance from their sun. Okay, that's all fairly elementary astronomy, but from here on out, uh, the uh, intellectual level will take a plunge. Uh, I mentioned here the fraction of planets around red dwarf stars. And uh, those of you who are not into astronomy may not know what a red dwarf star is. Those from the UK may confuse it with a British TV show. <laughs> red dwarf stars are 75% of all stars in the cosmos. They're little runty guys, smaller than the sun, much dimmer than the sun. You know, they're the dim bulbs of the universe, with the exception of my brothers, I guess, <laughs> the dimmest. But in any case, those, you know, 75% of all stars are these little dim guys. We never thought that they were good homes for planets, but now we know that they have lots of planets, and several of those planets seem to be, many of those planets seem to be the kind that might host biology. So the number of cousins of Earth in our galaxy is somewhere between 50 and 100 billion. Okay, so when people say, why do you think that ET is out there? Well, if you don't, remember, this is just our galaxy. There are two trillion other galaxies. If you don't think that, you believe in miracles. 
And while this crowd probably doesn't believe in miracles, uh, you know, most, most people do, because for the first 10 or 20 years of their life, their parents were telling them that they were one. Okay, so <laughs> given that, you know, any science discipline where the explanation is, well, we're a miracle, Bob, uh, that's not going to get past the referees. Okay, so that's why we're out there. We're looking for the intelligent variety with this uh, array of antennas. There are actually 42, which bears on uh, what was just said before. Um, that's, that's coincidence. It's actually not coincidence. It's when the money ran out. Uh, the Allen Telescope Array, 42 antennas, and we use this to uh, look for signals to eavesdrop on ET. Okay, now another question I get at cocktail parties other than would you mind moving out of the way of the hors d'oeuvres, would be, when are you going to find them? And when I first came to the SETI Institute, I thought, by the way, this countdown clock is never going anywhere. Is that a good sign? I still have 30 minutes. Hope you don't mind. I've got, <laughs> I've got 427 slides here, and, <laughs> and, and, and three of them are mathematical equations, so there you go. All right. Uh, <laughs> now it's down to 23. What a jump. It's a t it must have been a black hole nearby. Okay. Uh, it's, when are you going to find them? And, you know, when I first, as I say, joined the SETI Institute, I listened to Frank Drake and some of my other colleagues. Being asked that question, I thought they would say, well, we don't know. But he didn't say that. He said, I think we're going to find them within years. Okay. <laughs> and I was so stunned that he actually gave a number, and then I listened to Jill Tucker. She gave a number, Peter Backus. They, they all gave numbers, and I plotted up the numbers, and they correlated very well with the number of years until they were going to retire. So... I figured it wasn't a very good answer. So I, I've come up with my own answer, and it's based essentially on this graph here. Uh, this is some metric of the speed of the search, okay? And for the four of you who are still conscious, you may notice that the uh, vertical axis there is semi-logarithmic. So the speed of the search is going up exponentially, a highly overworked and incorrectly used word in today's vocabulary for some reason. And it just follows Moore's law, which is an economic law of the Silicon Valley, where I live, by the way. Um, so, in fact, the speed of the search is doubling roughly every two years, on average. So, I just worked out when will we have looked at a million star systems instead of the few thousand that we have so far, and I figured that's going to happen in the next two dozen years. So, in a, uh, a <laughs> in, in, a, in a bad moment of indiscretion, I was giving a talk in Germany, and I said, I'll bet every one of you a cup of Starbucks will find ET within two dozen years. And uh, that uh, injudicious bet has uh, garnered a lot of correspondence. Okay, <laughs> since all of you believe that ET is out there, you probably don't have too many quibbles about any of this, although you might be hoping for that cup of, cup of coffee. But I thought I'd talk about something that I do deal with that is in the realm of skepticism, and I deal with it every day. Every day, there are people who call up or send me emails saying, look, you guys are wasting your time because the aliens are here. All right, the aliens are local. By the way, I consider this one of the best of the UFO photos. Immodestly, I must say, because I made this photo in my garage out of an abandoned... It was, it was just a lampshade. I found it in an abandoned shopping cart, actually, in Mountain View. <laughs> but th this photo has been on the cover of many magazines, which should tell you something. All right, but maybe they are local. And one-third of the public thinks they are here. They're not just out there, but they're here buzzing the countryside and uh, maybe interfering with your personal freedoms. Okay. Well, could they be here? And if so, why are they here? What did they come for, right? And, uh, you know, I've been on panels at the Royal Society where people discuss why would the aliens be interested in Earth? And in more particular, in you. Because, you know, they, as far as we know, they didn't come to visit the trilobites. Now, mind you, the trilobites kept very lousy <laughs> history notes, so maybe they did, but, you know... Or maybe they visited the dinosaurs and stuffed a few into bottles and left. That could be. But most people think they're here now, after the Second World War, when indeed the skies were filled with all sorts of stuff. So uh, various uh, explanations for why they're here now, because that's kind of an inconvenient thing for many people, is the following. Well, maybe they've come from the unobtainium, whatever that is. <laughs> By the way, <laughs> I, I suppose many of you saw Avatar. And uh, Cameron made a mistake in that film. He not only told you how much unobtainium went for on the market, and I forget the number, $100 million per kilo or something, but he also tells you how fast the rockets require to get from Pandora, where they mine this stuff, back to Earth. 
And so I just did a little com uh, computation. And it turns out that bringing unobtainium back from Pandora was equivalent to ordering a book from Amazon and paying $30,000 for the shipping. So it's not worth the shipping, but okay. So maybe they come for that, except we don't have any unobtainium. Uh, this, photo, I, this photo never got very much play. I don't know why. Okay, maybe they've come because they don't like the fact that we have nuclear weapons, right? Maybe they don't like what we're doing to the environment. You heard Michael Mann yesterday. Or maybe they, you know, they just don't like reality television. I mean, there could be some reason. The only thing that we have that they don't have, by the way, this was a result of all those discussions, is our culture and our biology, the specifics of our biology. If you think that's enough to motivate the aliens to buzz the skies and haul people out of their bedrooms, great. But there's nothing else here that they don't have where they are, okay? And besides, and this is, a, I think, an important point, they don't know anything about any of that, right? Because the only way they could know, for example, that we have nuclear weapons or that you know, we're doing things to the climate or whatever is by listening to our news broadcasts. Hope they choose the right channels. But they can't do that if they're, if they're more than about 70, well, 40 light years away, really. Because all those early radio broadcasts, right, Marconi and all, all that stuff, they were at AM, essentially. They were at low frequencies, below 100 megahertz. And those frequencies just bounce off the ionosphere, something you can prove to yourself while driving around the country at night when you can pick up the clear channel stations from many states away. So they couldn't have heard that. It was only after the second, or during the Second World War when we developed radar, the British did, and television, FM radio, all that, that stuff does go into space. So there are maybe 40 or 50 star systems that could be looking at I Love Lucy or the nightly news and know that they don't like Fred Gertz's jokes or something and come to Earth to abduct you. I mean, that's, that's not many star systems. That doesn't make any sense, right? Okay, none of this does. All right, uh, let me just say a few words about Roswell because I'm sure people like, uh, you know, if, if you read the Skeptical Inquiry, you don't need me to discuss the particulars of any of these given uh, cases because they're Robert Schaefer and other people, you know, just take this stuff apart. But 1947, you know, the alien, <laughs> just picture it. Okay, we're going to go to that little blue planet down there, 27 light years away, and we're going to go visit the land of enchantment because we want a good Tex-Mex cuisine meal. All right, that could be a reasonable re <laughs> That could be a reasonable motive for the aliens. But, uh, in fact, there's a better m uh, explanation for all this that I trust you're aware of. And that was that some guys, at, I think it was New York University, looked at the inversion layer of our atmosphere and realized that when you have an inversion layer, the air layer above that acts as a duct for audio, sound, right? Sound is promulgated through that, that duct layer. And, you know, it's, I don't know, it's tens of thousands of feet up without too much loss. So the problem that the military had after the war, which was to know, did the Soviet Union have the bomb? Well, they thought they could solve it by launching these balloon trains with uh, essentially microphones, amplifiers, and a bit of telemetry, and trying to listen for a boom. Okay, this is Project Mogul. Here are photos of it. Uh, the, uh, this guy, Charles Moore, was still alive a couple of years ago. I don't know if he still is. And he looks at that crash debris and says, that's it. Now, I was asked, I was <laughs> taped a couple of days ago for Ancient Aliens, which is one of my favorite science uh, shows. And they said, what can we learn from the crash of the Columbia shuttle about the crash at Roswell? And I could say, well, one thing about the, the, the shuttle crash was that here's a space shuttle, s totally unsuited for interstellar travel, and it spewed debris over 2,000, 3,000 square miles of real estate from Texas to Louisiana. But in terms of Roswell, there was very little debris. You could throw it all into a, a pickup truck and take it back down to the city of Roswell. Whatever technology they have, it wasn't very much bigger than a Frisbee. So but nobody, nobody bought that. Here's another argument that I find interesting. Uh, several people uh, claim that the UFOs are preferentially seen uh, buzzing our missile silos, right? as if that's something that would interest them. If they can come all this way, this is not going to interest them. It would be like taking me back to the Roman Empire, and I say, okay, here I am. No, look, what I want to really see is where you make you know, your weapons. That's what I want to see. Probably not what you want to see. Okay, now I said that I get uh, these communications every day from people who are having difficulties with aliens, and uh, you know, they, they usually start their conversation by saying, I have some very important information for you. And, and that's always the tip off. And I talk to them all. Uh, I occasionally ask, well, almost always ask, do you have any photos or videos, stuff like that? About half of them do, 
and I say, if you want, I say, we don't look into UFO reports, but I'll look at your photos and videos and give you my opinion. Now, it turns out that photography, and for that matter, videography, are things that I, for various reasons, know something about. And very often, maybe in half the cases, I can say, yeah, that's internal reflection in your zoom lens, or that's hunting by the autofocus on your cell phone because it's at night and it doesn't know what to focus on, stuff like that, which I think are legitimate explanations of what they've sent me. Nobody ever says, thank you. <laughs> and, oh, yeah, okay, good. All right, uh, it makes a lot of sense to do that. And then there's the, this famous case from the 1970s. Remember the Viking landers plopped down onto the surface of our little ruddy buddy, right? And, uh, you know, looking for life, that's a different story. But the public became kind of, I don't know, disillusioned. Disillusioned isn't really the right word, but they became disenchanted for sure about, you know, the whole Viking expedition because they hadn't found life on the surface of Mars. So somebody at NASA, a genius, decided we can gin up more interest by showing them this photo because look at that, it's so amusing. There's a face on Mars. Now, this was underestimating the creativity of some members of American society who promptly started writing books, uh, putting together, <laughs> going on the radio, putting together websites about the face on Mars, Mars. Now, uh, this story had an interesting sequel for me because, I don't know, sometime in the 1990s, NASA had a new orbital uh, orbiter around Mars that had 100 times as many pixels as were used to make this photo. And uh, the science reporter at the San Jose Mercury News said, okay, Seth, they're going to make a really high, de high you know, a, a very detailed photo of the face on Mars, right? NASA resisted that, by the way, uh, in their infinite wisdom when it comes to public relations. They said, we're not going to waste, you know, time, effort, and money making a photo of the face on Mars, right? And the public was so against that that they said, okay, we'll do it. And so the night before, <laughs> reporter calls up, what do you think is going to happen? What is it going to see, Seth? And I said, well... I think it's going to see a mountain, right? And she said, really? And I said, yeah, yeah. I mean, but she said, but it looked like a face. And I said, yes, go down to Safeway and buy a 10-pound bag of potatoes and look at them all, and I'm sure you'll find a face, but it will never occur to you that this is an attempt by the spuds to get in touch. Okay. <laughs> so she ran with that story, and I got hate mail for two weeks. Now, uh, th this is the, the, the kind of photo that the more recent orbiters have made, and I don't know if that looks like a face to you, but the people who are defending this say, yes, it's still a face, it's just been weathered away. So, convinces me. All right, uh, there is th this sort of thing. Robert Schaefer writes about this a lot, that the, the, the fact that everybody has a cell phone now, you would think would improve the quality of UFO photos, and all that's happened is that the aliens have gotten farther away in response to this to make sure that the photos remain crummy. Um, <laughs> There's these kinds of things. I think this is a bird or an insect, okay? But this is an artifact of the kind of technology that you find in your cell phone. It doesn't have an actual shutter, a mechanical shutter that opens and closes, you know. Uh, then a bird would look like a bird. This looks like maybe a delta wing something or other. It's because it has what's called a rolling shutter. In other words, it, the uh, electronics just read out the chip, the sensor chip, one line at a time. And when it does that, you know, this line is exposed somewhat after that line was exposed, and that distorts the, uh, anything that's moving. You can see this next time you watch uh, videos on TV and they're from some, some guy's cell phone. If there's a, anything with a propeller in it, for example, a helicopter or something, you'll notice that the blades look curved. It's the same, same thing. So a lot of these photos are just the result of that. Then, of course, there's the, uh, you know, the Navy videos. I think you've been exposed to explanations about this. Uh, James McGahey, in fact, said to me, and when I asked him about this, he said, oh, I know what that is, Seth, that little tic-tac shape. Remember, this is an infrared camera, so what you see is dark is, in fact, something hot. And he said, you know, those are just the exhaust engines of some jet in front of this fighter pilot, which it might be. I mean, that's one possible explanation. There are others. I admit that it's not, you know, if it were dead obvious what it was, then it wouldn't have become a big stir. I think this is not good evidence, of course, for for alien visitation. Here are a couple of random facts just for your next cocktail party. Uh, this is a plot of when UFOs are seen. <laughs> I, I don't know if this means anything, but it, it's interesting. And then there's this. This is also when they are seen. So it does suggest that the explanation not, may not be extraterrestrial. Uh, another interesting part, by the way, this one says, uh, what does it say? Not for distribution or something on here. Do not publish. Okay, so don't publish this. Uh, but what it shows is that the number of reported UFO sightings seems to be going down since uh, 2014 or thereabouts. 
Uh, I don't know if that's statistically significant. It looks like it is to me. There are no error bars here. But it does suggest that maybe the aliens are losing interest in us. <laughs> I don't know why that might be. Okay. Uh, here's a question I asked the UFO crowd because, remember, this is not a small segment of the population, right? This is not like the, per the percentage that believe, for example, in Santa Claus, which I think is, I don't know, 12% or something like that, most of whom are under the age of 10. This is one-third of the public. So you ask them, well, why is, you know, the government covering up, which is what you claim? The big argument today in UFO circles is the argument for disclosure, disclosure that, well, they can't prove that the aliens are here, but don't worry, the feds can, and they will soon enough uh, under public pressure to do so. I think this is wishful thinking. Uh, the other thing is that they offer is that, well, you scientists just won't look at the evidence, which is really goofy because, you know, I can't speak for all scientists, but as one British scientist said to me years ago, he said, look, if I thought that there was a 1% chance that any of this was true, I would spend 100% of my time working on it. Now, he might not be the only one. You'd have tens of thousands of scientists beavering away trying to find the most, you know, evidence of the most important story of the 21st century, namely that Earth is hosting uh, beings from another world, okay? Uh, watch out for these usual problems, the arguments from ignorance. Here's Area 51. Did anybody go storm Area 51? <laughs> wow. I was going to do it, but then I read there will be no food trucks. <laughs> I, I, I didn't go. Area 50, I knew somebody worked at Area 51. I used to ask her, so did you see any aliens? She said, no aliens, lots of airplanes. Uh, then there's, you know, I, don't, I don't mean to insult the Canadians yet again here, but uh, here's a, a former minister of defense, I think Paul Hellyer was, and he claims you know, that uh, he's seen them. Now, the mistake the, the public, of course, makes is, that, well, this guy wouldn't lie. And I don't even think he is lying. I, mean, I don't know. But the fact that he says it's true, it's like somebody declaring that you know, Newton's laws aren't right. I mean, if, you know, witness testimony is kind of useless in science. And most of the people that I deal with on the phone eventually say, look, I don't care what you think. I know what I saw. I mean, boy, if you knew what you saw, why would you even call me in the first place? <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't get that. All right, let me just give you a couple of other ideas here. Uh, there are thousands and thousands of satellites in orbit around the Earth, and most of them are looking down. I mean, a few are looking outward, like Hubble and so forth, but most of them are looking at the Earth. And uh, something like 770 of them are imaging the Earth, okay? That's already becoming a, an issue for privacy, in fact, because they can see where you are. They can see your car. They can, you know, they can't quite see you, but it depends. If you lie down, maybe they can, because the resolution is like, if you're lying down, they probably should be paying attention to what you're doing. Uh, the resolution is about one meter, and they, you know, survey the entire Earth, or at least the land parts, uh, every 24 hours. So if they were really aliens, unless they were, you know, in saucers the size of a dinner plate, then these things would, would see them, right? Uh, now, maybe the aliens have cloaking technology, but as I mentioned here, Travis Walton could certainly see them, so I guess not. And you might say, oh, yeah, but of course, you know, sure they're seeing them, but nobody's telling us because these are Department of Defense satellites. Well, that's not entirely true. Right? Many of them, I mean, you know, they're, they're, they're Landsats, they're weather satellites, they're all sorts of satellites, and more going up. These, you know, sort of uh, mini satellites are going up all the time, which also have extraordinary imaging capabilities. So I think that this is a pretty good counter argument to the idea that, uh, you know, they're here. And this is something I just worked out on the back of a leftover envelope. Um, I don't know how many amateur astronomers, are any in the audience? Any amateur astronomers? Any professional astronomers? Okay. Uh, I, I made a guess at how many there were worldwide, and I, I had no idea how often they went out with their telescopes, but if they go even one hour a week, you know, and, and they only look at one thing, <laughs> they only look at, you know, Jupiter or something like that, it doesn't matter, because the UFOs are not going to line themselves up between you and any particular astronomical uh, object. If they spend an hour per week, then these amateurs are looking at the sky, the entire sky, every hour or two, right? And amateurs are pretty good at recognizing what they see through their telescopes. They should see several UFOs a week, even if the number of UFOs is quite small. The fact that they don't, I think, is significant. All right, I'm going to sort of finish up here by pointing out something that I think is at least of modest interest, unlike the rest of this talk. And that is, if the aliens are here, th this is something I wrote in an article, <laughs> if the aliens are actually here, you got to admit, they're the best house guests ever. 
right? They don't do anything. I mean, they don't interfere at all with your gusto-grabbing lifestyle. You know, they don't kill anybody. They don't hurt anybody. They don't solve any of our problems, right? And when I flew down here a couple of days ago, you know, we were sitting on the tarmac there at San Jose for about an hour, and the captain did not come on the PA system and say, you know, folks, there's some unidentified craft here in the area, and uh, since they didn't file a flight plan, we're just going to stay, stay here until they, you know, vamoose. How often does that happen to you, right? These aliens are great. They don't do anything. So finally, uh, just keep in mind that if in uh, another 20 years, either you open up your newspaper, you won't do that because you don't know what those are. Uh, open up your browser and you read, oh, scientists find signals coming from 770 light years away. And you can say, guess what? We have some cosmic confrères. Or you get a cup of coffee you cannot lose. Thank you very much. Thanks for watching. If you liked this video, be sure to give it a thumbs up and share it with your friends. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and ring that bell to be notified about new videos. You can follow us on social media, and if you really love what we do, consider supporting us with a donation. Links to all that good stuff is in the description below.